для советского народа это была Великая Отечественная война. Он вел ее во имя свободы и независимости своей социалистической родины, во имя избавления Европы, да и всего мира от фашистского порабощения. 20 миллионов жизней советских людей унесла эта война. Наш народ не забудет ее никогда. Леонид Ильич Брежнев. I'm Bert Lancaster. I'm standing on the shore of the Black Sea. Behind me is the city of Novorossiysk, which lies at the foothills of the Caucasus Mountains. This entire area is a peninsula, which the Russians call the Little Land. In 1943, it was the southernmost tip of the Soviet front, which extended from here up to the Arctic Sea. At the same time the Battle of Stalingrad was taking place, in the summer of 1942, the battle for the Caucasus began. Hitler wanted to open a road to the Near East, to India, by way of the Caucasus. It was a victory he wanted badly. That accomplished, he said, I will bring the war to the continental United States. The fighting for the Caucasus lasted 13 and a half months. In the battle for Novodicis and the peninsula, the greatly outnumbered Russians defended the little land for seven months. Nazi planes made up to 2,000 raids a day on this area. German artillery barrages were followed by heavy infantry attacks. It was a long, fierce battle in which more than one ton of explosives were fired by the Nazis for every Russian defender. Leonid Brezhnev, then a colonel, was among the Soviet soldiers fighting at Novorossiysk. The Soviet Army's victory in the Caucasus smashed Hitler's plans for an overland route to the Near East and India. Now, our story, the Battle of the Caucasus. In the summer of 1942, the mountains of the Caucasus were still at peace, bountiful, beautiful. Hitler had plans to change all that. The prize was oil, the rich Soviet fields at Baku, gateway to the Mideast. the lifeblood of Hitler's pensers. Early in the summer of 1942, the Wehrmacht launched its massive new offensive. They called it Operation Edelweiss. The first target was Rostov on Don. Then in the east, the Panzers were to break through to Grozny and Baku. And in the west, Novorossiysk and Tuapse were to be taken, then the coast road into Transcaucasia. In the center, mountain troops were to cross the Caucasus Range. By July 23rd, the Nazis had stormed into Rostov. On 
July 25th, the Soviet High Command ordered Rostov abandoned to avoid encirclement. Caucasia, new units were forming for what the Soviets knew would be a decisive battle. that ran through the mountains was strengthened. On July 25th, the Nazis forced the Don. The resistance was stubborn, but unavailing. Nazi Army Group A, led by General von List, now numbered 40 divisions. It was superior to the Soviets by one and a half to one in infantry, two to one in guns, eight to one in aircraft, nine to one in tanks. July 30th, an order from the People's Commissar of Defense was read to the troops. The enemy brings more and more fresh units to the front. To retreat further means ruin to ourselves and our country. We must stop the enemy at all costs, not a step back. the Wehrmacht ground forward towards the oil fields, the great naval bases of the Black Sea, and the mountain bastions. Further the south, they closed on the Taman Peninsula, key to the Crimea. It was a place of fancy, warm and exotic. Strength is in our indissoluble friendship, the message came. Everything for the front, everything for victory.
very soon the mountains were the front. And victory would depend on the resolution of those who lived and fought in them. beginning of August, the Germans had been in the foothills to the Caucasus. Now their goals were two mountain passes through which they would pour down onto the Trans-Caucasian Plain. The Nazis sent in mountain troops highly trained in this kind of combat. It was a remote kind of warfare, man pitted against man in the most rugged terrain. planted their twisted cross atop Mount Elbrus, highest peak in the range. But the Nazis could never exploit their limited success. The west of the mountains remained inviolate. Thwarted, the Nazis intensified their efforts to take the Black Sea naval bases to the south. Prime among these was Novorossiysk. It was to become the key city in the battle for the Caucasus. Novorossiysk would be bitterly contested. Ships of the Black Sea Fleet disembarked their marines, and as many sailors as they could spare to defend the base. The fighting was extremely heavy. On September 6, the Nazis cracked a way in. They took the naval facilities in half the city. There, the Soviet Marines and Red Army units held them. Street fighting raged in the city for days. The Soviets turned the tide at the October cement factory. It was here that the Nazis were stopped. In July 1942, four purely communist units had been formed to fight as shock troops. Volunteers continued to join the party. One of the critical sectors where these party members were sent was at Tuapse. Three times the Germans tried and failed to take it. The news came hot from the frontline presses. No word yet of outright Soviet victories. 
but solid news that victories were being denied the Germans on the coast road and in the oil fields. Russians, Ukrainians, Kazakhs, Georgians, Belarusians. All were welcome in the mountain villages. In the first week of August, Soviet engineers dismantled the Maikop field and carried off the reserves. What they could not move, they set ablaze. Hitler's dream of oil had been blasted. The Germans arrived at Maikop on August 9th, too late. They'd been counting on that fuel for their panzers. Nevertheless, they continued to reach for the oil fields at Grozny and Baku. At the end of October, they made a run for Orjan Nikitze. General Tulinev arrived to take command of the threatened front. New Home Guard units in the area took up arms and reported to the defensive positions. That included everyone capable of handling a weapon. On November 2nd, the German armored columns were reported within five miles of Origin Nikitze. They never advanced beyond that point. It was the furthest point south and east that any German was allowed to tread. Hagwood! On November 5th, the defenders of Orjin Nikitsa launched their successful counterattack. November 7th was the 25th anniversary of the October Revolution. Stalin marked the occasion by announcing that the country had passed through a severe trial but that the most difficult period was over. While Stalin spoke, the inferno of Stalingrad still burned. What he could not disclose was that the Soviet counteroffensive at Stalingrad had already been planned. Difficult phase in the Great Patriotic War was ending, both in the Caucasus and at Stalingrad. On November 19, 1942, a new phase began. The counteroffensive at Stalingrad was launched.
Marshal Zhukov wrote, first period of the great patriotic war ended in the complete failure of all the strategic plans of Hitler's high command and in great losses of Nazi Germany's troops and weapons. To a great degree, that predetermined further developments in the course of the Second World War. 1943 began with an all-out Soviet offensive all along the front, from Leningrad to the Caucasus. driven back, the population could return. The partisans came out of the forest and the mountains, their task completed. Entire families had served with the partisans, like the Trukhanovs. Now they reclaim their birthright ruined homes and gutted factories. Where the Nazis remained, there was universal horror. of the Red Army had good reason to make haste. In the first six weeks of 1943, almost all of the Northern Caucasus was liberated. Mount Elbrus on February 17th, the red flag marked the victory. What remained was the liberation of the rest of the Caucasus from the 400,000 Germans who were still there. The 
Nazis called their fortifications in the Kuban, the Blue Lion, Novorossiysk and Krymskaya were its strong points. They were almost impregnable. Hitler had ordered that the Kuban bridgehead be held at all costs. On February 1st, the Soviet 47th Army launched its offensive against the Novorossiysk. In addition, two seaborne landings gained a foothold behind the German lines at a place later named Malia Zemla, the Little Land. Most of these men were wiped out, but Major Caesar Kunyakov led 900 of them to the Misaka Mountain, where they fought off massive German attacks. All through February and into April, the fighting raged. April 17th, the Nazis launched Operation Neptune to throw the defenders of the little land into the sea. It was a tiny peninsula on the right bank of the Tsimeska Bay, behind Novorossiysk. Nazi formations of 60 aircraft at a time screamed over the little land. Over 1,500 sorties a day, over 2,500 bombs. Four German divisions were committed. The bloodshed in that bridgehead lasted 225 days, one of its defenders recalled 30 years later. He was Colonel Leonid Brezhnev, chief of the political department of the 18th Army. We had the Black Sea behind us and the enemy in front, Brezhnev recalled. It was with particular viciousness that the Nazis attempted to throw us into the sea off Malia Zemna. Defenders of the little land were not to be moved. Hitler's Operation Neptune failed.
On April 20th, the Berlin Philharmonic celebrated Hitler's birthday. In the Tommen Peninsula, the Soviets were beginning their major efforts to wipe out the Nazis. The battle for air supremacy over the Kuban had begun, and the Soviets were winning it. claimed a total of 1,100 Nazi planes destroyed. By the end of April, the Soviets had battered their way up to Krimskaya village, northern bastion of the German Blue Line. It was a hard battle. Fifth, the people of Krimskaya once more saw the light of day. But Novorossiysk was still in German hands. The savage fighting in the Kuban had far-reaching results. It drew in more and more German reinforcements, troops that might have made the difference elsewhere. Through the summer of 1943, the bitter struggle in the Kuban continued. Reconnaissance and raiding parties operated all along the Black Sea coast, probing the German defenses. All identification must be left behind. End of August, the Stavka, the Soviet High Command, completed its plans to liberate Novorossiysk and liquidate the Nazis in the Kuban. Marshal Timoshenko was to represent the Stavka. General Petrov was to command the front, and General Eselitsa's 18th Army was to assault the city by land and sea. The Germans had made every building a strong point. They had laid minefields everywhere. It was deceptively peaceful.
the amphibious force gathered on the Soviet side of Semeskaya Bay. Admiral Holostikov commanded the seaborne assault. His ships waited for H hour. It came in the night. September 9, 1943. When dawn came, it would be a year to the day since the Germans had been halted at the October cement factory. The seaborne attack lands straight across the bay, heading for three separate landing points at the seaward edge of Novorossiysk itself. Soviet Marines hit the beach early in the morning of September 10th and began to fight their way into the port. The battle lasted six days and nights. On September 15, the Nazis began to abandon their blue line and quit Novorossiysk. Novorossiysk had been the last of the Black Sea ports to fall into German hands. Now it became the first to be freed. The trickle of prisoners became a stream. The Nazis had expected to end the war in Novorossiysk, and many had. Novorossiysk was a city of silence, with few to welcome the victors. The Nazis had shot, tortured to death, or deported into slavery almost all of its population. For the handful who survived, there was little left to treasure.
Soviet press compared the terrible ordeal of Novorossiysk with that of Stalingrad. They had much in common. Now the little land was once more a part of the mainland. Forced out of the Blue Line, the Germans began Operation Brunhilde, their planned withdrawal of Army Group A into the Crimea and northward to the Ukraine, where the Battle of the Dnieper was in progress. The Soviets made arrangements to disrupt Operation Brunhilde. Taman Peninsula was swept clean of Nazis. On October 9th, 1943, a victorious chapter in the Great Patriotic War ended. The Great Battle of the Caucasus was over. In the course of it, Hitler had sacrificed 400,000 men. victory for these, and they were the heroes of the unknown war. But they still had more trials to face, two more years of trials. gentle with the ravaged shores of the Black Sea. The scars have been healed where Novorossiysk greets the sea. Brezhnev 
longtime colonel in the 18th Soviet Army in Malia Zemla, the little land recalls. The earth was in flames, rocks smoked, steel melted, and concrete crumbled. But the men, loyal to their oath, did not budge an inch. When you remember what we had to endure here, sometimes you don't believe that it all happened, that you could stand it. But we endured. We overcame everything. We went through all of it and won. story, the liberation of the Ukraine. In 1941, the Soviet Union suffered its greatest military disaster at Kiev in the Ukraine. Two years later, the Red Army swept back into Kiev, then ground forward through the winter along hundreds of miles of front. It was one of the most dramatic reversals of the unknown war.